It's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker of the day, um, the British writer Roderick Matthews, who's uh, done some really interesting work on uh, the British Raj and the whole British-India connection. So, uh, Roderick. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank everyone at AHA and Brit India for inviting me, particularly um, Hai Ching. So thank you for that. Uh, giving me this opportunity to talk for not very long. So I'll, I'll uh, gallop through what I'm saying. The thing is, when you have a short presentation, the problem is, you know, what do you leave out as much as what you put in? So I thought I might as well put in my books. So um, let me start at a sensible place. The, the, the theme of the talk this morning is to, to emphasise uh, something that I noticed by writing these books, which is that I think that the British-India partnership relationship link is the single most important bilateral international link in world history, and particularly in terms of delivering forms of modernity to the world. Now, that may sound a superficial comment, but I can actually back it up. And I've, I've, I've believed this more and more the more and more I've written, um, particularly the, the birth of what you could call liberal values in the modern world. Uh, people often give the French Revolution the credit for that, and it's certainly true that the groundwork of liberalism was set out in 18th century French intellectual history. But the actual implementation of actual liberal government was formulated by Britain in partnership with India. France was not a stable liberal country till the 1870s. And by then, modern liberalism and what it means had been worked out, sometimes rather painfully, in India. And Indians had adopted liberal values. Now, I'm not going to say that liberal values are somehow peculiarly Western. The humane and universal and rational parts of liberalism can be found everywhere. The problem, the trick that was pulled off, particularly in the British India link, was trying to make this into a workable system. Now, of course, liberalism doesn't, at that stage, does not include democracy, because democracy is a later invention, a later addition, and has caused a lot of problems all over the world and caused a great deal of sorrow to India actually as well in the original um, in the birth of, of the, the independent nations of South Asia. Um, how did I get started in all this? Uh, I, I do have some family links to India but I actually found out a lot more about those family links as I went on and uh, perhaps that's a story for another time. The first book I wrote was this one, it's called Flaws in the Jewel, it's looking at the Inconsistencies in British policy in India, as much as anything. Um, I'm critical of the British consistently through it. Um, I, <laughs> I got a terrible panning, of course. You publish a book in India about Britain, you'll get a terrible roasting. I was very polite in this book. Um, but I was slightly less polite as I went on. The second book, this, this one was to try to understand how the whole thing had happened, and how the Raj lasted so long, and particularly because it seemed very obvious to me that the policies were inconsistent and the policies were contradictory, particularly the one of backing landowners politically and backing peasants economically. Now, that seemed to be a disastrous policy, um, and it delivered the, uh, the very poor rural economy that India took into independence. However, it delivered political support for the British during the last 90 years of their rule. That's the if you like, the, the answer to that riddle. The second one I wrote, I didn't understand how the story ended, so I wrote a book called Jinnah versus Gandhi, which was a bestseller in India, and uh, got me a terrible, terrible torrents of abuse. Um, because I thought I was being neutral, but of course, if you're particularly pro or anti either of these characters, um, you can find plenty to complain about. So they did, and I was roundly told off. One man, one, one scholar, told me, uh, in, in print, not personally, but if I ever meet him, we'll, we'll see what happens. But um, uh, He told me it was the worst book on the subject ever written. Well, there you go. Um, that one, uh, the, the, the strap line, um, India got the best of Gandhi, Pakistan got the worst of Jinnah. And I moved on to try to understand what happened after the British left. See, see, my mind works logically. Here we are, the Indian rope trick, um, about democracy and uh, what India has to teach the world about democracy. Now, it became very apparent to me writing this book that India has to succeed as a country. 
All the problems facing the modern world, all of them, political, ethnic, religious, environmental, are all being faced in India. If India fails, we as a species are doomed. I, I, I mean that. If Indians can work it out, if Indians can get over the problems, we've got a chance. Um, I looked at that in this book and tried to find out what it is that India is doing right and the things that India can teach us in the rest of the world. There are eight of them. I won't go through them now. Um, now, that brought me to the fourth book, which I actually had an offer for and I had a deal for, and I, I took it away because I wasn't happy with it. And I'm, I'm finishing it now. I'll finish it by the end of the month. I'm just not sure which month. Anyway, um, thank you. <laughs> um, so where are we? How, how long have I done? Um, the thing which struck me right th going through all of this is that so many of the ideas that have been trotted out about the uh, in Indian history, British Indian history, are incredibly biased. The first books I started reading, I was astonished. I read un history at university and I read a lot of academic history. And when I started reading the stuff about India, I was astonished at how... Uh, careless, reckless it was, some of the things that were being written. And I spotted three schools. The Imperial School, which is discredited and no one's written an Imperial book for a long time. But it's a very familiar style if you get used to it. I've read a lot of it. The Congress style, which is the dominant style since. And then there's the Indian nationalist style, Hindu nationalist style. Um, I became very aware of all of those and I've tried to avoid lapsing into those schools. But uh, one of them, for instance, one of the things I realised is the more and more I read about imperialism, I wasn't actually sure what it was. Nobody agrees what imperialism is. is. Lenin said it was the highest stage of capitalism. I think the link to capitalism is very weak, actually, because there's nothing in imperialism that's got any... There's no novelty in imperialism in economic terms, and there's actually no innovations in political terms either. And I came across a... a, a I developed a, a, a radical idea of my own that actually what you're looking at in imperial rule is not anything new. It's actually old. The British took old ideas with them to India, tried to adjust them. They tried ruling in, 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 in an Indian fashion. That's, Warren Hastings tried that. Clive did it even more Indian by holding back and not even admitting he was doing it. But uh, Hastings tried to run uh, India through it, roughly Indian systems. And Cornwallis tore, tore that up in the 1780s and introduced Whig governance to the East India Company. Over the next 30 years, that was overturned. There's a very interesting decade that's been very underwritten between about 1805 and 1815 when Sir Thomas Munro was in London and basically persuaded the directors to run a different local government system, Riot Vari system, instead of the um, Zamindari system that had been tried in Bengal, which was a a direct importation of the idea of English landlords. From then on, they tried doing the Indian version, which was to back smallholders. Um, that's a very interesting uh, switch. There's another switch, of course, to crown rule after 1858. But that, again, is, uh, is represented somehow as a, as, a, as, a, as a tighter form of control, which it was politically, but actually it was a looser form of control in India because the British left all the princes in place. That's the first partition of India, 1858, when the princes were guaranteed their, uh, their lands and their uh, inheritance. Uh, there's a second partition, which is that the British fairly partitioned the, the economy between the rural sector, which they left alone, and the industrial sector, which they kept to themselves, and a few of their uh, f few people in uh, Calcutta and Bombay who managed to make money. But if you look at the genesis of Indian industry. It's not to do with the land at all. Look at the great families, the Tatars and the judges and so forth. They're all coming out of trade. They're coming out of opium, for instance. You know, I know the English get a lot of, a lot of uh, abuse for uh, opium, but actually Indian industry is based on the profits of opium as well. So I think you know, that should be said occasionally. Um, you know, what's source for the goose is source for the gander. Um, what did the British do for India? I'll, I'll wrap up now. Um, I think the one thing which has uh, not been credited or not, not been noticed um, is disarmament, internal disarmament. You know, you may or may not think that the British arriving in India was a good thing. But the ultimate benefit was 
internal disarmament, which was a very difficult thing for any Indian power to do. Can you imagine an Indian power that would be strong enough to completely dominate the subcontinent and then put its weapons down? That had never happened before. And the British did it at a great cost in blood and treasure to both sides. But actually what happened after that was that the space created by that internal disarmament allowed the best and brightest in India to trust each other and to build organisations which were not military organisations, and allowed, in the end, Gandhi to use the system of peace. And uh, I'm not claiming the British tutored Gandhi, because uh, I don't think they did. But it, the, the situation had developed to such a point. Um, so I would say, uh, you know, I know there's a lot of fuss at the moment, and I, if anybody wants to know what I think about Shashi Tharoor, you can uh, read Open Magazine next week. I've just written a long piece for them. You can find it online. It'll be out next week. Uh, I won't go into that now. Um, I would just put a slight warning about nationalism. I tried not to write nationalist history. These are not we books. I'm not the British. I'm me. We history is not a very good concept. Uh, it tends to produce distortions. Nationalism is a very two-edged sword. People talk about the Indian liberation movement, the freedom movement. I think actually nationalism was not a great, its great strength. It was actually its great problem because what they were asking for was essentially liberal freedoms, which they thought they deserved and which the British were not granting quickly enough. Nationalism was actually the problem in the end. But again, that's for probably for another day. Um, just sum it up, shall I? Controversially, I would say that uh, Britain made the peace but it allowed modern Indians to make modern India. Uh, anyway, my books are available online. Thank you for <laughs> having me. <laughs> One question before you desert. Oh yes, questions. It may be it, it may be a very crude question, but um, what do you feel Britain can learn today from India? Oh, um, well, better forms of tolerance. Um, I know that Indians may be losing a little bit of their tolerance as well at the moment because of political developments, but tolerance is the great thing. Um, I think that the co coexistence, um, India has a very long history of that and that the British have, are really only trying to learn to do it in the last 30 years. The British claim that they're tolerant, but uh, they're not accepting. They may be tolerant, but ex acceptance would be one thing, I think. Um, we've, uh, India was the first multi-national, multi-ethnic, multi-faith society of any scale in the world. and. Uh, I think, I think that would be one thing. I would say a, a, a full acceptance. There, that's what I would say. Thank you. Excellent answer.